So first thing, if you're not alone, if you've been going to the church for a while and you're like, wait, I gotta fill something out to become a member? Because I've been going here for a few years and um, I didn't know anything about it until they laid it on me and it dawned upon me. And so, uh, yeah, we are now officially about to become members of Cornerstone, but for you guys that have been here for a while, you've seen me and you know that I've been going, coming here for many years. Not many years, but a few years. Um, there's a couple of themes I feel like that was going on ever since the beginning uh, when John came up and gave that amazing exhortation. And then we went into worship and then my message. Uh, and I just love how when the Holy Spirit does that, um, there's a couple of themes, you know. And one of them is the power of prayer. One of them is freedom. One of them is purpose. But I feel like the power of prayer is, is one of the strongest ones that, is, that I felt in the theme of worship and the theme from the beginning. Uh, and I love that when Pastor Rich came up here, that's what he entered into. He's, he had you guys pray for one another. And so I just want to join in that again, and then we're probably going to do that at the end as well. But I want to pray. I want us to extend our hands to Pastor Rich and Pastor Judy. And I want us to pray. And if you're close to them, you could lay your hands on them. Uh, if you feel like, the, you know, that's something you want to do, I'd appreciate it. Uh, but 30 years, man, that is amazing. Amazing, amazing, amazing. And something, something that, I, that I feel like you said that was really important. Um, and I, I just, I've been having this thought, too, uh, with my life and my son and families in general is that you, know, you, you, you talked about like your family continuing the ways in the Lord, right? And I think there's a way to do it and a way not to do it. And I think you've modeled the way to do it is simply love Jesus, right? Simply love Jesus and have your life be an example of what Christ is, Christ, is, Christ looks like, Christ acts like. And so you've allowed your, your family members to just see the representation of Jesus within your lives. And by simply doing that, like it wasn't forced upon them. By simply doing that, they made their own decision um, to follow Jesus. And it's just a beautiful thing. And so, Father, I just thank you for Pastor Rich. And I thank you for Pastor Judy. And I thank you, God, for an amazing 30 years. And it's not over. It's just begun. I thank you for this season of their life, God. I pray for just abundance and favor and blessing in Jesus' name, that there would be even more revelation in this season than ever before, God. Continue to unfold this amazing story uh, of our lives that we walk with you and you begin to show us and reveal things to us, reveal certain things in this hour, God, that they've been asking for that they've been searching and delving deep into the word and in the prayer closet of hearing and listening from your spirit, God. I thank you, Lord, for just who they are as individuals, God, but also their marriage and how they've come together as one and how they have shown their children, they've shown us, they've shown so many people what it looks like to be a man and woman, a husband and wife in the sight of God in covenant, loving the people of God that you've put them responsible in responsible responsibility for. And so I just thank you, God, that they've said yes and they've been obedient. And so we just bless them in this season, God. In Jesus' name. Amen. You're welcome. Well if you're new here or if you haven't, I know I see a couple faces, Joshua. I didn't get that from the Lord. I heard you talking to somebody else. And is that your dad? Um, we have been going through the book of Acts. And so last, last week, Pastor Rich uh, spoke on Acts 11. And um, so now I'm entering into Acts 12. And so just a little backstory of Acts 11. It's dawned on the... Christian believers that the Holy Spirit is actually for the Gentiles as well. And I want to just pause with that real quick. You know, 
unless you have Jewish blood, you're Gentile, right? But who would that be today? Like, that's a question that, I, that I've been pondering, right? Is like, who, who would be the Gentiles today that maybe we might take on a pharisaical position of like, they don't deserve the Holy Spirit? You know, a couple of weeks ago, I preached on Saul on the road to Damascus. And in that, I, I, I said that he wasn't doing anything righteous in front of the Lord, right? He, wasn't actually, he was actually seeking to kill and persecute Christians, right? And yet God, in his grace and in his mercy, met him in a moment in time and transformed his life. Right? So in our eyes, we would think he didn't deserve that. Right? He's going to kill the people of God. And so I just want you guys to, to start to think about the scriptures differently. Um, and I want you guys to think about the people of today that we might take a position that they don't deserve the Holy Spirit. They don't deserve the grace and the mercy of God. Because I'm gonna be honest, we've all had those thoughts. I think I can speak for everybody, right? We've all had a thought that that person doesn't not, does not deserve. And if you feel like I'm over speaking, then it's okay. You can talk to me. But I mean, I know I've had those thoughts, right? In my past, um, but he's good. The goodness of God, he's good and he's merciful. And I want to think like him. And I don't want to ever have that thought of those people don't deserve the Holy Spirit. All right? The next revival might be a people group that we look upon with evil content in evil ways. Like how, how, how are they having a revival? When they look this way, talk this way, dress this way, act this way, how are they having a revival? Just think about those things. But in the story, so the Christian believers are starting to realize that the Holy Spirit is for everyone. And this furiates the, the Pharisees. It, it, it furiates the, the, the Jewish leaders of the day, right? Um, and they are actually getting the Roman leaders to, uh, the Roman soldiers to arrest and even kill followers of Jesus. And so now we enter into uh, the text that we're into today. And we're going to be in uh, Acts 12, verses 1 through 17. There's some papers on, on seats that have these verses. Uh, I'm reading from the NIV translation. But if you have your Bible, you can turn there as well. So it says, It was about this time that King Herod arrested some who belonged to the church, intending to persecute them. He had James, the brother of John, put to death with the sword. When he saw that this met with approval among the Jews, he proceeded to seize Peter also. This happened during the festival of unleavened bread. After arresting him, he put him in prison, handing him over to be guarded by four squads of four soldiers each. Herod intended to bring him out for public trial after the Passover. So Peter was kept in prison but the church was earnestly praying to God for him. The night before Herod was to bring him to trial, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, bound with two chains, and sentries stood guard at the entrance. Suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared, and a light shone in the cell. He struck Peter on the side and woke him up. Quick, get up, he said, and the chains fell off Peter's wrists. I think it's funny that he struck him too. <laughs> then the angel said to him, put on your clothes and sandals. And Peter did so. Wrap your cloak around you and follow me. The angel told him. Peter followed him out of the prison. But he had no idea that what the angel was doing was really happening. He thought he was seeing a vision. They passed the first and second guards and came to the iron gate leading to the city. It opened for them by itself and they went through. When they had walked the length of one street, suddenly the angel left him. And then Peter came to himself and said, 
Now I know without a doubt that the Lord has sent his angel and rescued me from Herod's clutches and from everything the Jewish people were hoping would happen. When this had dawned on him, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, also called Mark, where many people had gathered and were praying. Peter knocked at the outer entrance, and a servant named Rhoda came to visit the door. When she recognized Peter's voice, she was so overjoyed, she ran back without opening it and exclaimed, Peter is at the door. You're out of your mind, they told her. When she kept insisting that it was so, they said, it must be an angel. But when Peter kept on knocking and when they opened the door and saw him, they were astonished. Peter motioned with his hand for them to be quiet and described how the Lord had brought him out of prison. Tell James and the other brothers and sisters about this, he said, and then he left for another place. I'm going to be honest. I have a lot of questions about this passage. I have so many unanswered things within this passage, and I'm left with just questions and from from the beginning I want to what was highlighted me to me when I when I when I read this in the beginning was actually not about Peter it was about James and I had this thought and the thought is I feel like James gets overlooked in this right the focus is on Peter his escape from prison and everything that I just read but what about James? And this, this, question, this question dawned upon me. Why does God allow James to die and Peter to be released? And it just, it just dawned on me. Like, could God have done the same thing with James? Absolutely. Absolutely, right? So why, why didn't he? And there's going to be a lot of rhetorical questions that I ask because I don't have the answers. <laughs> I'm just being honest. I do not have them. The Holy Spirit has them, and you have the Holy Spirit. And so I want you to think about these things and ponder them. And when you go home and dive into the Word, ask Him, right? I think, uh, I think there has, there's this, like, thinking that preachers have it all together and know all things, and I do not. Right? I do not, and I'm glad I don't, because there is this divine search. There is this amazing mystery about God that we get to take part in. We get to ask him these things while we live on this earth, and he reveals these mysteries to, to us if we search, right? But... James was actually the first apostle to be martyred, all right? He was the first of the 12 apostles to be martyred. Now, Stephen, if you go back to Acts 7, was the first disciple of Jesus Christ to be, mar to be martyred, um, which Paul learned a lot from because he was there. In Acts 1.8, it says, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So that word, witness, in the Greek is martyr. But I want to talk about historical versus modern perspectives with the word. Because I don't think Jesus was saying, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and you will die for me. I don't think that. I think common perspective, modern perspective is that in order to be a to be a martyr, you must die for your faith. That's that's what we've attributed the meaning of the word today, but in the Greek, it literally just meant to be a witness. All right? I don't think God wants you to go die for your faith. I think it is a great honor if it leads to that, right? And it was an honor for James to have that happen to him. But that's not God's heart. Like, I want you to die 
you know? He just wants you to be a witness. And to be a witness, that just means to share the good news of Jesus Christ, whether, whether you're in the grocery store, whatever, anywhere that you're at. If we turn to, this actually fulfills a part of his word, though. Uh, if we turn to Mark 10, 35 through 40. James and John actually asked Jesus a question. And these are the sons of Zebedee, it says in 35. Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came over and spoke to him. Teacher, they said, we want you to do us a favor. What is your request, he asked. They replied, when you sit on your glorious throne, we want to sit in places of honor next to you one on your right and the other on your left. But Jesus said to them, you don't know what you were asking. Are you able to drink from the bitter cup of suffering I am about to drink? Are you able to be baptized with the baptism of suffering I must be baptized with? Oh yes, they replied, we are able. Then Jesus told them, you will indeed drink from my bitter cup and be baptized with my baptism of suffering. But I have no right to say who will sit on my right or my left. God has prepared those places for the ones he has chosen. I don't think they understood or realized what they were asking for in that moment. But for one of them, James, because we all know that the beloved John actually lived out a natural life until a natural death, James actually got to partake in that cup of suffering, in that death that Jesus was talking about. And it's something that I, I still don't understand within the text. There's still that question of why. Right? Why was James murdered and yet Peter was released? There's still that question that comes up and it's still unanswered for me. And maybe I'll never know. All right? But it's a question I ponder. And I think about my life. You know, I love John, when, this John. <laughs> I love John when he was giving his exhortation and he was talking about our, our, um, what we were made for. And he's talking about worship. We're made for worship, right? We're made to look at him and reflect him. We can see this in creation itself, right? If you look at, from the very beginning, God created the sun and he created the moon. Every time the moon is in front of the sun, it reflects the sun. Every time it's not in front of the sun, it doesn't reflect the sun. It's a picture of God and man, and we're supposed to reflect him, all right? And there's this beautiful thing about worship that we are meant to be. It's not something we do. It's what we are. We are worship unto him. But yet, I still have questions. <laughs> like, I believe that is our, our, our lifelong meaning of life is to worship him. But I also believe that there are specific purposes of our lives, right, that we, like for them, a 30-year purpose of their life was to be pastors. And not to say it's only 30, you know what I mean? <laughs> the past 30. Um, but I think about my life as like, what is my purpose for this season in time, what is my purpose for next season in time? I'm not there yet. I'm still focusing on this season, you know what I mean? But there's these beautiful things, these revelations that God wants us to discover, these truths, and he is laying it out in front of us. But there's a search, and I love how at the end, Pastor Rich wanted us to yell out, Jesus is Lord. And he is, 
And I want you guys to know that the Lord is good. The Lord is good. God has been like showing me his goodness. He's been revealing his goodness to me. And at the end, we might yell out, Jesus is good. From creation, from the very beginning, right? I think there is there's this mindset that there is something wrong with us. And I don't think that's true. I think there's something wrong with sin. God made us good. He actually says when he creates man, you are very good. I think we believe the lie that there's something wrong with us. There's something wrong with sin. We are good. How can a creation of God not be good? I just want you guys to know that. God is good. He's made you good. His creation is good. Sin in the world and in people is bad. Does that make sense? So now we're diving into the text. 12 verse uh, 5. So Peter was kept in prison, but the church, but the church was earnestly praying to God for him. So there was 16 guards, right? He was chained down. When I read commentaries, it said that he had to go through three gates to get outside. So there is nothing in the natural. Like, I know we've all seen movies about prison breaks and all that. Well, in his case, he's got two guards on his left and right, right? So there, he's not getting out of there naturally, right? But there's this but the church. But the church is earnestly praying. And who has a but story? And I'm not talking about your gluteus maximus. I'm talking about a, a, a moment in time where something natural can never happen, but something supernatural can happen, and it does happen within your life, right? I have a couple. Um, most of you guys know, you know, my, about my overdose in 2011, but what I didn't know in this moment, I didn't find out until years later, um, because if you, if you know my story, um, I overdosed in 2011, and then I ended up going to Hawaii, and my little brother, I'm giving you pieces, right? My little brother ended up going to prison, and so I didn't see my brother, my little brother for like six years, all right? But, so I found this out six years later, is that when I was overdosing and I was going to the hospital, my little brother was in the back seat, and he was praying over my life. And he didn't even, he wasn't even walking with the Lord, right? Like all three of me and my two brothers, we had this concept of Jesus, but we weren't necessarily walking with the Lord. But yet, he's sitting there praying and contending over my life to God. And lo and behold, I survive, all right? I end up dying for two minutes, flatlining, and they bring me back, but I survive. And it was that, this overdose that created this fear in me. This is 12 years ago. Created this fear in me of wanting to know who this God is, right? Of wanting to actually change my life. But it all started with prayer. It all started with prayer that I didn't even know was happening until six years later. Um, another but God story is that the, the, the testimony of my charges. If you, if you know my story, that I had a whole bunch of charges that were miraculously dropped. Eight felonies and a whole bunch of financial debt. $30,000 uh, just wiped off my record. And I believe it was because the church, because I was saved by this point, um, the charges happened before I was saved, were praying and contending over my life. We can look through time and Assemblies of God is a testimony of prayer. There was this man named William J. Seymour. If you've heard about the Azusa Street Revival, right? Prior to the viral in 1906, he would pray five hours a day. And he did that for a long time. And so one day he was like, it's not enough. 
I'm going to pray seven hours a day. And he began praying seven hours a day. And then in 1906, in California, a revival popped off, and the Holy Spirit met mixed people groups. When in that time, it wasn't okay for certain people groups to be together. And out of that was birthed the Pentecostal movement, the modern Pentecostal movement. And out of that, eventually, the Assemblies of God came to be birthed. All started with prayer. All started with prayer. I was talking to Carly about um, testimonies, right? I wanted, I wanted some testimonies about prayer. And I have so many, but, man, I just, like, lose it. You know what I mean? I, <laughs> I have a bad memory. I just, I don't speak that over me. I have a great memory. A gr- I have the mind of Christ. Um, uh, but she started sharing this testimony that I totally forgot about. Um, me and my wife met in Baltimore. Uh, GSSM, Global School of Supernatural Ministry, first year. We go to Baltimore for a mission trip. And on the way there, we pray. We do Because we're going to do evangelism. We're going to do treasure hunts is what we called it. And so we would pray. We would ask the Lord. God, give us a vision, give us a, a, a picture of a person, a color, whatever, right? Give us something that we would know when we walk upon these people that that's who you want us to talk to, right? And so she had a friend, her name was Faith, and in the car, Faith had this picture of a man with a scar on his head. And so they're in Baltimore now, and they, they go to this man, and he has a scar on his head. It's the, the picture that she got. And this guy, he got shot in his head. And he still had shrapnel in his skull. And so they begin to pray. And pieces of the shrapnel actually come out of his head and fall to the ground. <laughs> Crazy. All started with prayer. All right? There's power in prayer. Uh, I love this quote from Leonard Ravenhill. Leonard Ravenhill was a British preacher, writer in the 1900s. And I want to preface this by saying I don't think preaching is bad. I'm up here preaching. Um, but I just, this, when, when I read this quote, it just grips me inside. It says, preaching affects men. Prayer affects God. Preaching affects time. Prayer affects eternity. The pulpit can be a shop window to display our talents. The prayer closet speaks death to display. Man, I love that. Because when you are in your prayer closet, there's no show. It's just you and God. All right? It's just you and God. And it brings to death everything that we want to put on display. At least I hope that this, that's the outcome. I want it to be the outcome in my life. Verse 6. It says, The night before Herod was to bring him to trial, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, bound with two chains, and sentries stood guard at the entrance. The night before. So Peter was in prison during what? Passover. Good job, Pastor. Good job. <laughs> the Passover. The Passover is seven days, right? And so we don't know from Scripture um, whether it was the first day or, like, we don't know from Scripture if he was locked up for one day or six days, right? But we do know that he was in there for an extent of time and God waited till the night before. And that just, it raises so much questions, <laughs> right? It, this is interesting because why would God wait to the last minute? And this is another rhetorical question. I don't have the answer. Um, but the point I'm trying to make is that maybe you have been praying for a miracle and you're thinking about giving up. And you're thinking about giving God that last minute miracle. You're thinking about giving the devil that last-minute miracle. That's what I meant to say. Because you're giving up. You're thinking about giving up. And my prayer is just to continue to contend 
and to hold on 